Now, today, I would like to talk to you about the Bible and the type of book that it is. The Bible is, in many ways, a most unusual book. And it's a most unusual book in that it has a dual authorship. In other words, God is the author of the Bible, and in another sense, men are the authors of the Bible. The Bible was written, actually, by about 40 authors over a period of approximately 1,500 years, Some of these men never even heard of the others, and there was no collusion of the forty. Two or three of them could have gotten together, but the others could never have. And yet they have presented a book that has the most marvelous continuity of any book that has ever been written. And there is a collusion here, and that's the collusion of the Holy Spirit. And when you say dual authorship, somebody says, you mean to tell me that the Holy Spirit is the author and that these men are the authors also? I mean exactly that. I mean that the Bible is a God-human book, a God-man book. And in many senses, the Bible is very much like the Lord Jesus Christ himself. You see, he came to this earth and became incarnate. He was both God and man. And John put it in this simple way, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And do you know you can almost say that about the Bible? The Bible became flesh and dwelt among us. And it, on the divine side, is a book that we're going to talk about that, and I hope I can get my foot in the door. There are four things on the divine side, on God's side. It's a God book, and that is revelation, inspiration, illumination, and interpretation. I want to talk about those four. And by the way, somebody's saying, this is getting to be rather complicated. May I say the notes that we have on guidelines for studying the Bible are are available And they are the first ones that are being sent out. If you'd like to have the full copy now, but these messages I'm giving are in print and will be sent out to those today that are listening if you'd like to have them. Now, on the divine side, we want to talk about revelation, inspiration, illumination, and interpretation. Now, on the other side the human side, and it's a very human book. May I say, it was written by man from all walks of life. There was the prince and the pauper. There was the very highly intellectual and then very simple man. Actually, Dr. Luke writes almost classical Greek in a period when the Koine Greek was popular. And did you know that his Greek is marvelous? But I have news for you. Simon Peter wrote some Greek also. It's not so good, if you want to know the truth. But did you know that God used both of them? God, the Holy Spirit, used both of these men. And that has to do with inspiration. Now, that means that God was able to use these men without destroying their personality, and he let them express exactly their thoughts, their feelings, and you'll find they all did. And yet, through that method, the Spirit of God was able to overrule in such a way that God said exactly what he wanted to say. And that's the wonder of this book, the Bible. That's the reason that it's a human book. It's like my Lord that walked down here and grew weary and sat down at a well, and he talked with people down here and communicated with him. This is a book that communicates. I want to talk a little about that, too, by the way, next time. I hear today that you've got to come down to the level of the hippie or the level of the group today that are immoral, 
and that you have to enter into that. I don't agree with that at all. This is a book that talks to men in all walks of life. And the thing that has thrilled us about this through the Bible program is this, that there is a professor in the University of Ohio that never misses one of these programs. There is another professor in a university in the South that encourages all of the faculty to listen to the program. And did you know that there are men that are working right here in Los Angeles, right down here on the war? They don't speak very good English. <laughs> in fact, there's some of them barely speak it. They understand it, and they listen to the program. One man has written in. He said, I don't write very well. I just don't quite not able to express myself. And all you'd have to do would be to read his letter to agree with him. And may I say to you, the college professor and the man that is not even have an eighth grade education, they all get the message when this book speaks. And then they talk about the generation gap. I'm amazed today that the young people that are listening right south of us down at San Diego at a college right now, if you're listening to this program around the noon hour, there's a group down there that meet every day to listen to the program. And some argue about it, some disagree, but they listen. I may mean, I say to you, the Word of God communicates, friends. It gets through to you. We have children that listen to it. We hear from them. And then we have retired people. May I say to you, friends, the Bible knows nothing about a generation gap. It speaks to mankind today. The Bible as it is, for men as they are. How important that is. It's a God book. So I hold in my hand right now a book that's supernatural. And in this book, God says 2,500 times, God said, the Lord has said, thus saith the Lord. He's made it very clear that he's speaking through this book. And if you have a blood-tipped ear, you'll hear him, my friend. May I say to you, this is a God book, but it's a man book, a human book. The book I have before me here, it's pretty well worn to begin with. It's a very human book, if you all know. I got it marked up here. And it's a translation. It's not really the original at all. If it was the original, I couldn't read it. It's put in a language that I can understand. And we're going to talk about some of these versions. I suppose we'll get around to that next time. But the point I'm trying to make today, friends, is that this is a book that on one side is a God book. This is a book that can communicate a life to you. And that today that you can even become a child of God, begotten, not by corruptible seed, but by incorruptible, the Word of God that liveth and abideth forever. And then on the other side, it's a very human book. It talks to you about your aches and pains and your groanings. And Paul says, we that in this body, we do groan. And I'm at the age right now where I find out I do groan, friends, and I'm for being scriptural. I do a lot of groaning. My wife tells me sometimes you ought not to groan. I said, I'm being scriptural. The Bible says that we groan in these bodies, and I'm going to groan. This is a human book, friends, but it's a God book. It, there's no book to compare to it. Why in the world do you read these little old paperbacks these silly things. I watched the other day a person over in the Hawaiian Islands sitting on a hotel reading one of these dirty little filthy paperback books, and out before it was the gorgeous tropical scenery. <laughs> Why read these books when you got the Bible, friends? And it's a thriller. It's a thrilling story. By the way, if you're not on the Bible bus, get on right now. Write in and ask for the notes and outlines. Let us hear from you. We'd like to take you along because right now, in a few days, we'll be beginning in the book of Genesis. Now, I said last time that the Bible is a most unique book. No book to compare to it in many ways. 
but this way primarily. It is a book of dual authorship. And what we mean by that is that there is the divine side and the human side of the Bible. On the divine side, this is God's book. He's communicated to man. He's spoken here. And he's got through his entire word, so much so that if God had anything else to say that he hadn't said in the Bible, well, he's already said it. And if God spoke out of heaven right now, he'd just repeat himself, because he said all that he wants to say to this generation. And by the way, he didn't learn anything when he read the morning paper. And when man went to the moon, he didn't discover anything that God didn't already know when he gave us the Word of God. And you know, friends, it doesn't look to me like man discovered very much up there either. And it's a pretty expensive trip just to get a sack of rocks to bring back, by the way. And I'll be perfectly willing to go out here on the desert and get them a whole wagon load of rocks and sell them lots cheaper than that. And I think they're very much the same. You see, it's the same God that created this universe that we are in today. May I say to you that that's a thrilling day in which to live, by the way, so that God has communicated with man. And that book is the Bible. That's the divine side. But it's a human book. God used about 40 authors over a period of 1,500 years. Each one spoke, expressing his own feelings in his own generation. He had his limitations. He made his mistake. Poor old Moses made mistakes. But when Moses was writing the Pentateuch, somehow or another there's no mistakes that got in there. The interesting thing is that I read in seminary many years ago a little book called The Mistakes of Moses. I always thought that whoever that author was, the book ought to be called The Mistake of the Author because his mistake was writing on the mistakes of Moses. Now today, I'd like to develop these four subjects in reference to the Bible. That is Revelation. Second, inspiration, and third, illumination, and fourth, interpretation. Now, revelation means that God hath spoken, and that God has communicated to man. Inspiration guarantees the revelation of God. And illumination has to do with the Spirit of God being the teacher and not this poor preacher here in Los Angeles. If the Spirit of God does not communicate to you, I can't communicate to you, but the Spirit of God can. And since he wrote the Bible and we give it out, I find out he'll communicate. And that's the wonder of it. That's the glory of it, friends. And then the fourth is interpretation. And here's where we all pull each other's hair. Really, the problem is not that the Bible teaches many, many things. The problem is there are many, many people that are interpreting the Bible. Unfortunately, they all don't interpret it my way. I wish they did, but they don't. And we just have to go along with them and be patient with them, because when we all get into his presence, there will be perfect agreement then. Now we see through a glass darkly, then face to face. I'll be changed. You'll be changed. And we both will be made right. Someone has said there's always three viewpoints. Your viewpoint, my viewpoint, and the correct viewpoint. We'll get the correct one someday. Now let's look at these. First of all, Revelation. And again, may I repeat it? God hath spoken. And 2,500 times we have in the Bible, Thus saith the Lord. The Lord didn't want you to misunderstand that he had spoken. And you'll find that in the first chapter of Hebrews, he made it very clear that God hath spoken. Let me turn and read that. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, spoke in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made 
the world. Now, will you note here, first of all, Revelation. Wherever you'll find two persons endowed with a reasonable degree of intelligence, who harbor the same feelings and desires, who are attracted to each other more or less, you will find a communication between them. Persons of like propensity separated from each other. They delight in getting in touch with each other. Communication, we call it. And they rejoice in receiving a communication from another. And this innate characteristic of the human heart explains the post office department, the telephone, and the telegraph. Friends write to friends. Husband away from home writes to his wife. And the boy or girl at school, they write home asking for money. And ever and anon, they send an epistle of a girl to a boy. And then the boy to the girl and the sentence not so good there. All of this is called communication. It's the expression of the heart. The Scripture says, deep calls to deep. You will recall the story of Helen Keller. I remember the thrill that came to me when I heard her story and read the account of it, of how this woman shut out from the world in so many ways, blindness, deafness, and no way to communicate, it would seem. And then that way was opened up, and she could communicate probably better than many of us who can see and talk today. And now, may I say, on the basis of that, I'd like to ask you a reasonable and certainly an intelligent question. Isn't it, therefore, reasonable to conclude that God has communicated with his creatures to whom he's committed a certain degree of intelligence? those he's created in his own likeness. May I say to you, if we did not have a revelation from God right now, I think that you could just wait there at your radio and he'd be speaking to you because of the fact, my friend, we could expect God to speak to us. Now, I think that God has communicated more ways than through the Scripture You'll notice that the writer to the Hebrews says that God in the Old Testament spoke through the prophets, and he now has spoken through Christ. And both the prophets in the Old Testament, the revelation of Christ and the New Testament, both are in the Word of God, of course, and that's the only way you'd ever know about the communication from either ones. But I think God communicated through creation. Paul says that that the invisible things are seen by the things that are made. And the heavens do declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. But I'm not interested in dealing with that. I believe also that God has communicated with man through the human heart. Don't misunderstand me. Not through visions or anything like that. But I believe that today God has communicated through the experiences that you and I have. I'm sure that many of us can look back on our lives and we can see the hand of God in our lives. But the thing that we're concerned about here is that God has communicated to us through the Bible, and that is his revelation. And this book has 66 books, and I have in my notes that we send out how you can get the Bible on one hand. And if you have that, and I hope you do, if you don't know the books of the Bible, learn them like that. You put the Old Testament on your tips of your fingers, and you put the New Testament down in the valleys between the fingers. And on the thumb, you just start out there and put the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Then go over to the finger, the index finger, and on that, you put the historical books of the Bible, Joshua, and so on. And then you come to the poetic books, the next finger, middle finger. And you begin there with the book of Job. And then you put the prophetic books, major prophets, on the ring finger. And you begin with Isaiah. And then you put the minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, and so on, on the little finger. Now down between, between the thumb and the forefinger, put down there the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Then you put the historical book of the... New Testament, book of Acts. Then you put the epistles in the next valley. And then in the last one, 
You put the prophetic book of Revelation. May I say to you that that's the way that God's spoken to us. And there is today an attack that's made upon the Word of God. I recognize that. Dr. Elmer G. Homringhausen, former dean of Princeton Theological Seminary, in his book, Christianity in America Crisis, he's made this statement, few intelligent Protestants can still hold to the idea that the Bible is an infallible book. Some might still claim for the original copies of the Bible an infallible character, but this view only begs the question and makes such Christian apologetics more ridiculous in the eyes of sincere men. Now, I say that's a terrible indictment coming from a professor in a seminary, but it was made, by the way. And then the seminary up in New York, Union Seminary, a professor there, he made the statement that no intelligent person could believe the Bible is the Word of God. Well, I believe the Bible is the Word of God, and according to that, I guess that I would not be considered intelligent, according to these men. May I say they boast of the fact that they are humble. I wonder what kind of humbleness is that. It says everybody that does not agree with them is a fool, and they are the only intelligent people. That's a dangerous position for anyone to take in any way. But the very interesting thing is there have been some very intelligent people that have believed the Bible, and there have been some that haven't been so intelligent, apparently, that have brought in, may I say, damnable heresies that are a curse to the world today and plague our society. Let me give you this statement from Dr. Gregg. He says, Aristotle's philosophy was the learning of the schoolman. It clustered the Bible. It worshipped bones in the churches in an attempt to link them with the apostles. The 10th century was the darkest, but in the 20th century, Aristotle's philosophy through Maimonides, Spinoza, Hegel, and Darwin worships bones in the universities and museums in an attempt to link them with the apes. It has also given us Unitarianism through Emerson in America, Reformed Judaism through Moses Mendelssohn, and Bolshevism through Karl Marx. It is the doctrine of demons and seducing spirits. May I say to you, I like that statement very, very much. May I also add that there have been men that have been intelligent, men that have believed the Bible years ago. B.B. Warfield, it is said of him that he probably had the most giant intellect of any man that America has ever produced. Would you like to know what he says? He says, the Bible is the Word of God in such a sense that whatever it says, God says. I like that, my friend. And Bishop Hadley said, there is more meaning in every word of holy writ than we shall ever get out of it. And I personally believe in what is known as the plenary verbal inspiration of the Scripture. That means that we believe that the Bible is an authoritative statement, and that every word of it is the word of God to us and for us in this day in which we live. And may I say to you, that's very important for us to see today. The words are inspired. I heard the little story several years ago of a girl who had taken music lessons, singing lessons from a very famous teacher, and she was giving her recital, and he came. And after it's over with, why, she was anxious to know what he said. He didn't come back to congratulate her, and she said to a friend, what did he say? Well, he said that you sounded heavenly. And she just couldn't believe he said that. And so she asked again. She says, did he say I sang heaven? He said, yes. He said that. She said, well, I won't know exactly what he said. What did he really say? Give me the words that he said. Well, if you really want to know the words, he said that was an unearthly noise. May I say to you, friends, an unearthly noise doesn't mean it sounds heavenly. And believe me, 
that it's the words of Scripture that are inspired. And we need to recognize that. We need to keep that before us today, and I'd love to have time to develop that a great deal.